give you a specific example of how the CAVE-2 has accelerated some neuroscience research. And in fact, it's in a project which has already been mentioned by Wojtek into Huntington's disease. Okay. Um, I hope you can see that okay. Uh, so the CAVE-2 facility is a landmark ultra-scale visualisation facility at Monash. Uh, it runs in both 2D and 3D modes and uh, at the time of construction, and we still believe this is true, we believe it's the largest hybrid 2D, 3D visualisation facility in the world. It is 84 megapixels, 84 million pixels and uh, there's a computing cluster which uh, powers this uh, facility, essentially it's dedicated to just displaying graphics and that runs at 90 teraflops um, or about one teraflop per screen. There are 80 screens in total. Uh, it features a very high resolution head and wand tracking system uh, comprising uh, some Vicon cameras around the top of the screens and uh, for motion capture. And there's also a 22 channel sound system which uh, is a 3D sound system which enables us to play really neat tricks with the audio and place sounds in certain locations within the, the facility itself. You'll notice that it's circular, it's eight metres in diameter. And uh, there's a really good point why circular systems are important to us and I'm going to show you that in my example. Now, um, Wojtek uh, briefly alluded to this and I want to point out how we think about this type of uh, facility in the context of an overall strategy at Monash University. And we call this the strategy for the 21st century microscope and it underpins our thinking when we uh, operate with a new research centre. So a, 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 a microscope which has been at the centre of scientific discovery for hundreds of years really has three parts to it. It has a light source down the bottom, it has focusing knobs in the middle, and it has a viewfinder at the top. We believe the modern microscope isn't a single instrument, but in fact the seamless orchestration of capabilities and facilities that perform those roles. So down the bottom, the light source can be a beam line at the synchrotron or an MRI scanner, you know, some data producing instrumentation. In the middle here, we have the focusing knobs. Now, when a researcher uses a microscope, they are interacting with the microscope. And this is a theme that's come up in all of these talks in this afternoon's session, is it's really important to make that supercomputer interactive, uh, because that's how researchers uh, want to en engage with the modern microscope. And uh, so we build this around the massive project, which Wojtek spoke about, and uh, that represents the kind of the core or the engine of the microscope. And then the computer screen is the viewfinder. And there are obviously many different types of viewfinder, uh, but to us, um, immersive visualization and the Cave 2 facility offers a, a unique opportunity. And in fact, we like to describe it as the highest quality lens for our microscope. Now, all of this is obviously linked up with high-end uh, high uh, IT uh, to manage the data. We know we're on a, a data deluge. Uh, exponentially growing amounts of data need to be managed. And then at the top of the microscope, we could think about having others actually viewed and look down our own microscopes. And so we, we regard that as the data dissemination part. So over five years, our e-research program at Monash has been built around this concept. And I'm gonna talk to you about just one part of that. Voitex already talked about the middle part. Um, and in some sense, Gary and, and others represent the, the lower part. So the Cave 2 facility at Monash is, uh, was built in a brand new building and uh, this is David Barnes, he's the manager of the facility and what he's looking at here is cr uh, tractography data and, uh, and here he is now looking at some data from an, an, uh, an, uh, well, an archaeological site. Um, but to, in many senses the, uh, the the tractography uh, demo is the, one of the more spectacular ones. 
Now this is Jason Lee, who's at the Electronic Visualization Lab in Chicago, and they, they worked with us in building our Cave 2 facility. They built the prototype, and uh, they kindly allowed us to build ours bigger. So <laughs> that was nice of them. Um, but that's their facility. They were responsible for um, the original cave. Actually, the lab, you might know, is also responsible for the original computer graphics in the very, very first Star Wars movie. Uh, in case you're wondering, CAVE is a recursive acronym. Now, uh, uh, we do do a lot of demonstrations, and the CAVE facility does provide an opportunity to showcase Monash research. Uh, what, I'm, what you're seeing there in a time-lapse video is a number of demon uh, one demonstration which runs through a number of different use cases for the CAVE. And uh, as I pointed out at the very top, the Connectome example was always a stunning example. The one, that, the one example that gets all of the audience going, ooh, ah, is actually standing on the surface of Mars and seeing Mars uh, as th though you were in a spacecraft on the surface at the limits of human visual acuity. Now, the K facility is both a 2D and a 3D facility. Uh, the, the, 2D, the 3D nature is very important to us. In fact, one thing you appreciate very quickly is that uh, objects, when you see them in the cave, appear as though they're in front of the screens. They're almost as like they're occupying the space that you're standing in. This is very important to us to help us understand spatially what's going on. Uh, when you go to a 3D movie, most of the action appears to your brain to occur behind the screen. So you're like looking through a window. But in the cave, it's actually happening all around you. Uh, the architectural firms love it because they can make you feel like you're walking through a room. Uh, but it's also the highest quality lens for discovery. And, um, and a number of our biomedical scientists love it because it enables them to do things they've never been able to do before, um, see things at incredible detail, but also within the context of the image. Uh, we have histology images, for example, that are 100,000 pixels by 100,000. Um, the researchers in the past could not actually view those on a regular computer screen, but they can in the cave. Uh, you, some of you might have seen this particular image. Um, it's always a good uh, slide to talk about when we talk about visualisation. We think it's underdone in, in general, and we are working hard to promote its use. Um, because to us, visualization actually helps you discover the unknown unknowns. Uh, there's a famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld, um, which I'll let you read there. Uh, he was talking about Iraq, but um, it also applies to research. Uh, computers, if you're applying them in a um, data mining context, only find things that you know about. They only find things that you know how to find. Uh, visualization provides you with an opportunity to see things that you'd never seen before. And in fact, you could think of it um, like the cave facility as a machine for generating a new hypothesis. Uh, the reason for that image there is half of you, I imagine, can see what's in that image. Um, put up your hand if you see what it is. Yeah, it's about half of you. Um, uh, some of you have difficulty finding it because you don't know what it is. <laughs> um, but now that I'll tell you that it's a dog. It's a Dalmatian dog. Um, I think probably those who couldn't see it before can now see it. So that's a, my little point about finding the unknown unknowns. Uh, to, to us, neuroscience represents the exemplar for big data visualization. Um, we've seen it in other domains. Our e-research center is dedicated to all of the disciplines, but neuroscience is the one of the most important disciplines for us. Um, but the point here is the humble desktop no longer works. Um, the screen's too small. Um, the bucket's too small in terms of the, the desktop computer is being dwarfed by the big data that's coming off the instrumentation. And when you want to collaborate around the data, you tend to huddle around the little computer screen. Uh, it's also typically in 2D. So um, to us, the, the Cave 2 is the natural place to go to, um, to visualize. Uh, as I said, the neurotractography visualization is a very good one for us. It's immersive, it's colorful or memorable. The spatial comprehens 
comprehension dramatically improved over the desktop. For example, as you are swimming through the tractography, you, you really do appreciate the space and the gaps and the, 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 size, the, the, the sizes of the clusters of fibres and so on. Um, but the one example I'm going to show you now is actually a, a combination of both 2D and 3D. And it's uh, really a good example of how the brain, our human brain, is actually the best pattern processing machine we have. Um, and it really is applied in, um, in very good uh, detail in, in this particular example. So we call this comparative visualization, and this is in the context of the Image HD project. It's a nice little pun, but HD here stands for Huntington's disease. So as Wojtek mentioned, this is a study of 80 subjects. Uh, we've got some controls, around 30 of those, pre-symptomatic, around 30, and some sufferers, around 20 of those. But we, what we do is we visualize their tractography and we visualize all 80 simultaneously. I'm going to show you a, d a video of this actually running, um, but I'll point to the, the research, the paper. Uh, as Wojtek mentioned, N um, Nelly uh, Giorgio uh, Caristia <laughs> Caristianis um, is the, the um, principal investigator on this work. Uh, this paper was actually published in 2014 and was selected by uh, HD Highlights as one of the most influential in Huntington's disease. And uh, as I mentioned, it, the idea is in the context of the cave is to investigate the structural connectivity in the pre-manifest and the symptomatic uh, uh, studies, uh, subjects, and uh, there's uh, some control in there as well. Um, being 80 patients, it maps very naturally to the 80 screens within the cave. Now, the first point I want to make about the circular nature, when you're in the middle of the cave, um, you see things, you don't see the pixels, you're seeing things at the limits of human visual acuity, so it's like a retina display. Um, but you're also at equal distance from all 80 of them, so you don't tend to naturally favour one particular group over another. Um, and so that's why I believe circular facilities are, are actually important. Um, we can sort the brains in any order. Uh, we, we often sort them by um, the onset of the disease or the controls and so on. Or we could sort them by age and so on. And uh, David Barnes, um, who led a lot of the visualization work here, prepared this nice video of it running for me. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll run it, it takes about three minutes, and I'll talk to it as it runs. I, I want to highlight, first of all, you're not seeing a video of the cave in action. You're seeing, just in order to give us enough detail in the video, uh, three columns of the, of the cave. Um, there's a cast of thousands involved. Uh, these are the names of all of the people that were involved in the work. And I really do hope this is going to run. How do I? did run in the test. This is not my computer, which doesn't help. Yeah, I did test it. Do you, do you have it on? I've got it, I do, I've got it on. Okay, so we're seeing uh, three columns of the cave, and then on the left, you're seeing the web interface of the, um, th that's running on an iPad that you take with you into the cave. Uh, so here we can, oh, it's a bit hard to see, but here we can choose how many track samples to reveal. There's a single uh, structural brain, 
uh, but what we've done is we've mapped on the tractography onto of the patient of the studies uh, subjects onto onto the brain, and so we we can choose how many samples. Uh, there are millions of tracks, uh, but we can choose how many of those we wish. Now what we'll do is now we'll reduce the the uh, the the density of the structural brain um, so that it doesn't get in the way and then we can start to rotate. Now when you rotate you end up rotating all 80 simultaneously. Uh, so here we are moving from the top and then moving to a rear view. Now at the moment, I know it's a bit hard to see, it looks like all of the brains are the same. Um, so what we'll do is we'll pick a particular region and we'll just um, expose the tracks that are coming from that region. Now it's pretty clear that we're dealing with different people. Uh, so we'll just, um, again, we'll rotate to get a rear view of the, of the 80. And, uh, and as you can see, it's quite clear. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the main conclusion in that, pub, in that research is actually observable within the cave. So the main conclusion in the research is that uh, there is a difference between the controls and the symptomatics uh, when you isolate two particular regions and you look at the tracks. Now here what we've done is we've now chosen a, a two regions and we're looking just at the tracks between those two regions and we are going to push the number of samples right up because of course we're, we're dealing with a much smaller set of, uh, of links. But now, um, and it's probably not very clear to you, uh, there are clearly identifiable differences that occur at a group level between the controls and the symptomatics in that um, particular case. And so this has opened up a number of opportunities for us. Uh, we've validated previous research using the cave, but uh, there's other things that the cave's done. It's actually accelerated the research process. Uh, in fact, the, the group talk about how it accelerates the data quality control work time. Uh, what used to take three months in terms of uh, cleaning up the data is now down to two hours. It is just so much quicker to do it when you see everything at once. Um, so as I pointed out, uh, the technology and the approach has been validated um, by the same discovery. So this provides us with hope that we're going to see new observations within, and new discoveries within the cave. Um, and that discovery was essentially group level differences between, in the pathways between the two regions. Now I know I've got one minute, so I'll wrap up. Um, as I said, the CAVE-2 is a hypothesis generation machine, and it's the highest quality lens to look at digital data. But it's also an effective communication tool for understanding spatial aspects. Now I'm just going to throw out there, this the final slide, uh, maybe some future work. Um, for example, what about using the CAVE for some sort of neurofeedback type training, having a number of people within the CAVE with uh, EEG headsets navigating and interacting with what they're seeing. Um, and so we can do that, uh, do have them interact with a virtual environment for a group of patients and not just a, a single individual. Okay, with that, um, any questions? Uh, so Paul, that, that was fascinating and my question is a bit more general around the, the principle of visualisation led scientific discoveries, mm -hmm. which is something I know that David Barnes has espoused and, and I think it's really fascinating. I guess it's a question about the, the relevance of a given of that approach to different disciplines and after the work you've done over the last year or so, how do you see it in terms of that approach? Um, applying to the, the sciences you mentioned, including neuroscience. Yeah. So it, what, what we, um, in, in our microscope analogy, it's clear that we tend to work closely with disciplines that use instruments that produce data. Um, and 
and, and as I said, uh, discovery is often um, results by simply just looking down a microscope and going, ah, now that's interesting, I wonder what causes that, or wonder why that's like that. And that drives a hypothesis, which then derives, hopefully, the, the discovery. So disciplines which operate in that way work particularly well with the cave. And so the other example is, of course, structural biology um, and understanding, I guess, how things are coming together um, from a structural point of view at the molecular level. Uh, but, but also, again, they work with instruments that produce a huge amount of data. And uh, rather than mine it for stuff they know about, they want to use visualisation to discover things they don't know about. Okay, as chair of the session, um, I'll, I think we're going to wrap it up because it is